The book of Isaiah is the longest of the prophetic books, sometimes called the fifth gospel because of its use in early Christianity. Uh, while it's the longest of the prophetic books, it's not all actually from Isaiah. Now, this was realized uh, at least by the late 19th century. There was a legend in antiquity that the prophet Isaiah had been martyred under Manasseh, that he had been sawn asunder. And when the German scholar named Bernard Doom published his book on Isaiah, arguing that half the book came from a couple of hundred years later, uh, somebody published a review saying, sawn asunder again. <laughs> but this was actually one of the results of, uh, uh, of source criticism that really stuck. Nobody disputes it. And indeed, it would be hard to dispute it. Because once you get to Isaiah chapter 40, it's clearly relating to the Persian period, even to the point of mentioning King Cyrus of Persia by name. Now, I guess for some period of time, people were prepared to believe that God had spoken to Isaiah about things that wouldn't happen for hundreds of years after his time. But uh, that kind of approach to the prophets gets less credence nowadays. Uh, it's presumably these prophets spoke to their own time and first of all had to make sense in their own time whatever further meaning or significance you might find in their prophecies in light of later events. So, chapter 1 to 39 counts as first Isaiah. This is the 8th century prophet. After that, you have what's called Second Isaiah, but these are just really the oracles of an anonymous prophet added on to the oracles of Isaiah. For the moment, we're concerned with so-called First Isaiah. Even within that, there is a lot of material that is probably much later, uh, notably chapters 24 to 27, sometimes called the Apocalypse of Isaiah, and just on the basis of the style of material that's in there, most people think that is quite late, later even than Second Isaiah. We'll get to that in due course. And then there are other passages, some of the oracles against foreign nations in chapters 13 and following seem to relate to the fall of Babylon which would again be a hundred years or so later. And there is a long prose account of the invasion of Sennacherib, which seems to be lifted out of Second Kings. And if time permits, we'll say something about it, but you probably discussed that already with Professor Wilson anyway. So, back to Isaiah of Jerusalem. And... Uh, Everybody begins the study of Isaiah, not with chapter 1, but with chapter 6, which is the call of Isaiah. Why didn't they put that up front? You know, Ezekiel puts his call first. Jeremiah puts his call first. Well, probably just because somebody... There's at least one theory is that chapters 6 to 11 possibly without a few passages in that, but most of 6 to 11, was an original booklet. Even that wasn't all composed at one go because you have some first-person first material and some third-person material in it. But you have there, at least in 6 to 9, a cluster of material from the early part of, of Isaiah's career. And then, at some point, this was updated and people added a few chapters before it as well. According to the superscription in 1.1, the vision Isaiah said of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, the call vision is in the year the king Uzziah died. That was 742. And... Uh, Hezekiah was king when Sennacherib invaded Judah in 701. 
So that gives you a career of more than 40 years. That's probably the longest career of all the prophets. And Amos was probably in and out of there in a the summer. You know, he may not have lasted a full year. <laughs> but, um, but Isaiah evidently had a long career. Now, Isaiah is in many ways a different kind of prophet from Amos anyway. Uh, Bob Wilson distinguishes between central intermediaries and peripheral intermediaries. Most of the prophets, or many of them at any rate, are peripheral figures like Amos, outsiders, freelancers, and then uh, Isaiah is a central intermediary, which means he actually seems to work for the king. He seems to have access to the royal court. So that's one thing that's different about him. The other thing is, in the list of kings under whom he prophesied, you notice they're all kings of Judah. Nobody from the north. No particular interest in northern Israel. Equally, we will get through first Isaiah in all probability without mentioning the Exodus. Now, the Exodus is mentioned once or twice, but they thought to be in later additions to the book. But it's not the framework for the preaching of Isaiah the way it was for Amos or Hosea. For Isaiah, the framework is the promise to David, the choice of Zion. So it's Zion theology and Davidic theology. Now, these are different from the Mosaic Covenant because they're unconditional promises that God would be with David. A king from the line of David would always be on the throne. With Zion, God is in that city. It shall not be moved. Now, Isaiah seems to accept that. You know, where Amos is constantly inverting people's hopes, saying, aren't you like the Ethiopians to me? So what if you came out of Egypt? Isaiah never challenges the promise to David or the promise to Zion. Now, the way he applies them will not always be the way people would have liked him to apply them. And we'll see some of that. But he doesn't question them. And in fact, this is probably the only, well, not the only one. You'll also get this in Habakkuk, but we seldom get to Habakkuk in this course. Uh, but of the prophets we do get to, he's the only one who talks about faith. Faith, by and large, is a Christian virtue rather than a Jewish one. And it's uh, or a New Testament issue rather than a, an Old Testament issue. But it's an issue in Isaiah, and we will stop to see what it means. So, chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, of course, if you read Micaiah ben Imla, you know prophets did claim to see the Lord. You also know how, how to recognize the Lord if you should happen to see him. He is high and exalted and sitting at a throne. In other words, like a king magnified. Bigger, more powerful. This is one of the ways of imagining God. But the throne, hem of his robe, filled the temple. The temple was thought to be the palace of the God. Seraphs were in attendance above him. We don't really know what seraphs were, but they were, the one most popular view is that they were kind of flying serpent and fiery. And then uh, I mean, you associate them with cherubim, and cherubim were not cherubic. You know, if you want to know what cherubim looked like, you can go to the art gallery downtown. And you see there are some of these hybrid Mesopotamian creatures. They were meant to scare people off, basically. They were guards, scary things that surrounded the, the king to scare people off. So anyhow, you have the seraphim and one call to the other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
Do any of you know what does it mean to be holy? Sorry? Set apart. Yeah. Set apart is good. Uh, set apart, anything else you might say about it? Blameless. Blameless. Yeah. Yeah. Pure, you might add. They're not quite the same idea, but holiness certainly entails purity. It isn't quite the same thing as moral goodness. And in the context here, what they, it's set apart, but it, it's also, you know, God doesn't need to be set apart. In a way, God is apart. God is different. And to be holy is in many ways the antithesis of what it means to be mortal. To be mortal means that you're subject to impurity and decay. We walk around in perishable uh, wrapping. Now, to be holy, on the other hand, is something you associate with the spirit world. And holiness is dangerous in the Hebrew Bible, in the ancient world generally. Uh, you may remember the story in the books of Samuel when they were moving the ark up to Jerusalem. And an unfortunate man put out his hand to steady the ark and was electrocuted on the spot. The idea is that holiness is kind of like electricity. You know, it can be great, it can be, give you energy and power, but it can also destroy you. So, holy, holy, holy. So, what they are, and now this is a, a refrain in the book of Isaiah. One of the titles for God in Isaiah is the Holy One of Israel. So, um, uh, and I said, uh, woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, when he says I am a man of unclean lips, does it mean that he has said something bad? Why does he feel that he's a man of unclean lips? Yeah, it's, it's just in virtue of being human. You know, this is why in some parts of the Hebrew Bible they say a man cannot see God and live. Now, and I think this is the thought that occurs to Isaiah, is I'm done for. You know, I have gotten into this place where I ought not to be. And... Um, then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar, and touched my mouth with it, and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. How is that for a ritual, for forgiveness of sin? Yeah. So if you want to get rid of sin and impurity, according to this, what's the best way to do it? Burn it out. Now, this will have implications for the message that he's bringing because he also says, I live among a people of unclean lips. And it also has uh, implications for what is going to happen to the people. How are the people to be cured of their uncleanliness and impurity? By burning. So, um, then, um, uh, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for me? We had something like this, you remember, in the story of Micaiah ben Imla. God, you know, sometimes wants people to brainstorm a little bit, wants <laughs> suggestions. The model here, you know, is not the unmoved mover dictating everything. The model here is a king in his council looking for suggestions. And so Isaiah volunteers. Here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and turn and be healed. 
And I said, how long until cities are laid waste and houses without people, until the Lord sends everyone far away and vast is the emptiness of the land? Now, how is that for uh, a description of the purpose of prophetic preaching? I've often toyed with putting it in the syllabus, you know, as purpose of the course. Never, never quite had the nerve to do it. But uh, why would he not want people to turn and be saved? Andrew. Yeah. Now, you, you see, we often think that this is the context that, in which prophets preach because the way the prophetic books are edited, you're given the impression that they were all preaching the covenant. And so, keep the law. If you break the law, repent and be saved. But that doesn't seem to be the way they all operated. And in fact, what we'll find more typically, and we'll find it very clearly with Ezekiel, is that the purpose of prophetic preaching is so that they know, so that they have no excuse. It's putting it on the record. And that's all. What's going to happen is going to happen. You're not, they're not preaching with the view to averting the divine judgment. By the time these prophets kick into action, it's usually too late for that. Now, it's possible that this is written, you know, in, uh, with hindsight, that the prophet, somebody looks back at the prophet's career and says, well, nobody listened to him anyway. Uh, but I think it's probably more that, it's more almost like heartening Pharaoh's heart. It's setting them up, leaving them without excuse. That's what he's doing. And how severe is it? And this is a running debate about Isaiah, is he ultimately a prophet of doom or a prophet of salvation? And I think you would have to say he is both. Because like Hosea, there is always an element of hope, I think, in Isaiah, but it's, uh, even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. And then in all probability, some scribe added, as a marginal note, the holy seed is its stump. But that touches, actually, on another motif in, in Isaiah, and that is, a remnant shall remain. This is the name he gives one of his sons. If a remnant shall remain, is that good news or bad news? Well, it's good news after the disaster falls. But right now, you know, if I say, well, a couple of you will pass this course. <laughs> Is this good news or bad news? <laughs> well, you know, while you think everybody should be saved, it's bad news. <laughs> because it is, you know, it's kind of 95% destruction is what he's preaching. But at the same time, it's not 100% there is, in the end, hope. Now, the hope that Isaiah holds up is very much tied to the promises to the Davidic line. And the part, uh, the, the things for which Isaiah is most famous are a series of prophecies that were taken certainly as messianic in Christianity, were certainly, at least some of them were taken as messianic uh, in, the, in Judaism before the rise of Christianity. And uh, debatable, if you want to call the Messianic in the original context, then we need to talk about what is meant by Messianic. A Messiah is an anointed one. The king is the anointed one par excellence. He is the Lord's anointed. Saul already was the Lord's anointed. It does not, in the Hebrew Bible, usually refer to a figure who is to come in the future. It usually refers to the king who is on the throne. Psalm 2 is a classic text of that sort. 
where the Lord speaks to his king, I have set my anointed uh, on Zion, my holy mountain. And so, you know, it gets to have the future connotation when there no longer was a king on the throne. Because there was on the book, so to speak, a promise to, uh, to David and uh, that, you know, this had been kept for a couple of hundred years and then when the Babylonian crisis happened, suddenly you didn't have a king anymore. And it's at that point that Messiah tend, comes to refer to a future figure, somebody who will come and restore the Davidic line. Now, we're not yet there in the book of Isaiah. At this point, there is a king on the throne. So in chapter 7, in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, the king of Syria and the king of Israel went up to attack Jerusalem. This is what is known as the Syro-Ephraimite War. And the reason for it was this. Assyria was by far, at this point, the greatest power in that part of the world. Assyria wanted to expand. And some of the small countries wanted to form an alliance to oppose it. So this alliance was led by Damascus and Samaria. Ephraim is northern Israel. They wanted Ahaz to join. Ahaz was reluctant for a very good reason, because to oppose Assyria is an excellent way to get yourself killed. The chances of defeating Assyria were nil. They're constantly hoping for help from Egypt, and the help from Egypt never materializes. Egypt is described later on in the book of Isaiah as a broken reed that pierces the hand of one who leans on it. So uh, here is Ahaz trying to hold out against Syria and northern Israel. And when the house of David heard that uh, Aram, Syria, had allied itself with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Now, this has to be read against the background of the Zion theology, which we'll see later on in the Psalms, where it says, God is in that city. It will not be moved. We will not fear, even though the earth shake. Now, it's very easy to say that kind of thing in the temple, you know, to sing it as the psalm or something. And then when you see an army actually coming up outside the walls, it's quite a different matter. And evidently, uh, uh, Ahaz wasn't too convinced about it. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sha'ar Yashuv. Children of prophets are walking billboards. And uh, in this case, again, this wasn't going to win him any friends. Now, the king was out at the upper pool and the highway to the fuller's field. In other words, he was checking on the water supply. And there was, in fact, a tunnel which survives to this day, and you can see it if you go to Jerusalem, that was built to bring the water from the spring outside the wall into the city to, as a, a, a security measure in case of a, of a siege. The advice that Isaiah gives him is, be quiet, take heed, be quiet, and do not fear. Now, over the last 30 or 40 years, a lot of Assyrian prophecies have been published that we hadn't known before. And the, the Assyrian kings also had their prophets who typically went to the king, and this is very typical of what they would say. Do not fear. Ishtar of Arbella will protect you, you know, or whatever deity you're, that they're speaking for. So this is the, the typical advice of Isaiah. Be quiet, do not fear. Now, as I said, 
he has faith in the promise to David. What faith in the promise to David means is if there's an army outside of the wall, don't worry about it. This is not easy reassurance, actually. Because, he says, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. The head of Aram is Damascus, the head of uh, Damascus is Rezim, etc. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. All of this said with the implication of these don't amount to much. They're nobody to be afraid of. And then in 9b, if you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. Now in Hebrew, that's a play on the root amen. You know, the word that gives us amen means to be firm. It's also the same root that gives us the word that we often translate as truth and, 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 and fidelity, faith, amunna. These are all related words. And this is what it means. Now, you see, faith in the ancient world is not a matter of believing that there is a God. That was more or less taken for granted. The question was much more how many gods are there. <laughs> but but uh, you know, anybody who didn't believe in some god or gods was just thought to be odd, yeah. not to be taken seriously. The test of faith is whether you really trust your god. Now, there, there is... Um, uh, one of the best books in biblical studies in the last few years was by Teresa Morgan, who will be joining the faculty here in a couple of years. And um, it, it's called Pistis. Now, she's writing about the idea of faith in a Roman context and then in the New Testament and early Christianity. And her thesis is that there, too, what it primarily means is trust. And it's you know, the degree of trust that you have in this deity. You know, whether you believe in it isn't really an issue. That's kind of taken for granted. So that's what, um, this is what uh, uh, Isaiah is demanding. And then he says to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not put the Lord to the test. And Isaiah said, here, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals? Must you also weary my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, what should, how should the next sentence be translated? <laughs> of course, in Christian tradition, it was always, a virgin shall conceive. Now, the Hebrew word is alma, which strictly means a young woman of marriageable age. Young women of marriageable age may indeed be virgins, but not necessarily. It's not really the point of the word. And for that of it, that was also true, I think, of the Greek parthenos, which is the word that was in the Greek translation and which was then translated in Latin as virgo. But in the, there is a word for virgin in Hebrew. It's batula. And when the RSV was being translated, there was a great scholar named Harry Orlinsky who said, if they wanted to say virgin, they'd have said batula. So the RSV went with uh, uh, a young woman. And this was a major reason why when the RSV translation, not the NRSV now, but the RSV, this is back about 1951, when it was published, there were book burnings. People didn't like this. This seemed to be a abandoning. But now, uh, undoubtedly, and I think most, if when the NRSV came out, nobody bothered burning it. By, by that people had gotten over it, you know, <laughs> and that this really wasn't the point. So a young woman shall, is with child and shall bear a son and, you sh and shall name him Emmanuel. Uh, he shall eat curds and honey, etc. Now, 
big question is, who is this child? What child is this? Now, first thing is, the young woman is already pregnant. He's not talking here about, and in a couple of hundred years, you know, if you're worried about deliverance from Assyria or from the, the Syrians, don't worry about it. You know, if in 600 years, God will send a Messiah and it'll all be okay. It wasn't quite that extreme. <laughs> it's a sign that would be there for the king to see. And I think, basically, you have two possibilities. One is that it was the a son of the prophet. In favor of that is that the prophet always gave his children symbolic names, and the prophet would be in a position to say what name uh, would be given to this child. But I think it's actually more likely that it's the son of the king. And a major reason for that is that Emmanuel means God is with us. And this was virtually a slogan of the Davidic house. We will see it in the Psalms. God is in that city. And that, I think, is what is being said. So the sign that he's getting is that you're going to have an heir. In Jewish tradition, the king in question is often identified as Hezekiah. This may or may not be right because there's confusion in the Bible over the date at which Hezekiah came to the throne. So it could be, but maybe, yeah. Mike. Well, not in its historical context. Flatly. <laughs> now, you see, when you get to the New Testament, you have a rereading of Scripture and a re-signification of it, whereby people look at it and say, well, in light of what has now happened, we can see a more profound meaning in this. And there are a lot of passages, especially in the book of Isaiah, that fall into that category. But if you're asking, first of all, for what would this have meant as an act of communication between, ah between Isaiah and Ahaz, not only would it have made be utterly unintelligible if it meant Jesus? How could Ahaz ever figure that out? But I think, oh, equally, it is not about a Messiah to be named later. You know, it's something that is to happen in the here and now. Now, again, is it good news or bad news? Well, in this case, I think the birth of a child you know, by any normal human standard, is good news. It's a sign of hope. It isn't always the easiest thing. And indeed, if it happens during a siege, this probably isn't the best timing, you would say. But even so, it's a sign of hope. So he goes on to say, he will eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. Now, curds and honey. Why would he eat curds and honey? Signs of abundance. Well, you may think uh, when the spies go into the land in the book of Joshua, they report back that it's a land flowing with milk and honey. So it's curdled. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, it's still something you can live on. But actually, you'll be told a little bit further down in chapter 7, verse 21. On that day, one will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and will eat curds because of the abundance of milk that they give, for everyone that is left in the land shall eat curds and honey. Now, the reason for it is you won't be able to plant. You won't have crops. So that all you will have is that which grows of itself. You get the same message towards the end of the book in the time of Sennacherib, when again, this time, Judah was brought to its knees, 
uh, the Sennacherib boasted that he shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. And although it's not reported in the book of Isaiah, it is reported in the book of Kings that the king actually scraped the gold off the doorposts in the temple to give him every cent he could raise, to give the king of Assyria every cent he could raise to get him to leave. So it wasn't an easy deliverance in that case either. And in that case too, the, uh, in the, the, what Isaiah says is in the first year, eat what grows of itself. In the second year, what grows from that. And by the third year, you'll be able to sow and plant and return to more or less normal life. So you see, this isn't preaching simple miraculous deliverance. In the story of Sennacherib, as the story is now told, the angel of the Lord comes down and smites, what is it, 80,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And there are various theories as to what might actually have happened. Maybe there was a plague. But it's apparent, though, that it wasn't just that the Lord came to the rescue of Jerusalem. It was not an easy deliverance. But it was a deliverance. And that's what Isaiah is saying here, that however bad things may be, you're having a child. God is with you. There's hope. Now, I want to get in at least a little discussion of two famous passages in Isaiah 9 and again in chapter 11. Uh, if, you know... One, one criterion for recognizing messianic passages in the book of Isaiah is if you're familiar with Handel. <laughs> you know, if, if it brings a tune to mind, <laughs> you've got it. And in this one, it's untrust the child is born. <laughs> now, the context of it here is um, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them light to shine you, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. Now, what he's talking about there is the darkness. The people who lived in darkness were the people in northern Israel. It may be referring to what happened already in the 730s when the Assyrians came through and deported some people. Or it may be referring to what happened in 722 when they came back and finished the job. But now one of the uh, discoveries about ancient Israel in recent times, in the last 20 or 30 years, is that the size of Jerusalem doubled after the fall of Samaria. The simplest explanation of it is a lot of people came south as refugees. But this was a dramatic increase in the size of Jerusalem. And this is surely what he's referring to here. You have increased the nation. So, you know, after the Assyrians have withdrawn, even if they left smoking ruins in Samaria, again, there is hope. One of the possible dates for when Hezekiah came to the throne is 715. Uh, the, the, debate the different indications in the, the biblical text, point either to 725, which would be before the destruction of Jerusalem, or 715. But very probably that's what this oracle is about. Now, in Psalm 2, which we will meet again later on, God says to the king, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. Now, that was language actually inherited from the Egyptians. The Egyptians had ruled Jerusalem back in the second millennium, but there were Egyptian traditions that survived in the kingship in Jerusalem. And the, the idea that the king is the begotten son of God is one of them. This idea would have some ramifications down the road in the New Testament. But for the moment, to say the king is the son of God means he stands in a very special relationship to God. 
they do not speak of the king as adopted, which you would think would make sense since he is announced as the king, the son of God, when he ascends the throne. But that's not the way they speak of it. They speak of him as being the begotten son of God because that's a stronger claim. That's a stronger connection. Now, in all probability, that is what is going on here in chapter 9, that it's not actually celebrating the birth of a child. It's celebrating the advent of a new king. And he is being born as son of God. So unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the names, uh, the names he is given. And this, again, was typical of Egyptian enthronement festivals. The kings were given uh, a series of names. And some of these, you might say, would be a little over the top if you were really talking about a child. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Now, we'll come back to talk about this when we get to the Psalms. Was the king a god? You see, in ancient Egypt, yes, quite emphatically. Even in Mesopotamia and probably in Canaan, the king was uh, sort of divine. Now, you see, it's not, the question is not, is the king God with a capital G? It's not, is the king the one who created the universe or who maintains the universe? There are lots of gods. Divinity is a much more extended concept in the ancient world. And the king in Judah, as well as in other places, was thought to be on the divine side of that line, not a regular human being. So not God Almighty, but still a god. Now, that is what's being proclaimed here. So, what you get in chapter 9 here, I think, is an oracle celebrating the advent of a new king. This is, sometimes one gets this kind of feeling when you get a new president. Not always, but sometimes. <laughs> you know, I think when Obama was first elected, there was a kind of wave of enthusiasm like this, that it will be, he'll establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. This is the kind of thing you can believe about a new king. It gets a little harder to say, you know, at the start of the second term or whatever. Uh, but it, it's political propaganda in this way. But I think, you see, Isaiah is affirming it because he's holding it up as the ideal. This is what the king should be. Now, the other famous messianic oracle, and this one uh, was a messianic oracle in antiquity, and that's chapter 11. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. Now, there is uh, an endless debate and no agreement as to when that oracle is likely to have been written. Uh, the debate circles around the stump of Jesse. Does this mean that the whole line of David has been cut down? If so, you would say this has to be after the Babylonian destruction. Some people think it might refer to the time of King Josiah, who came to the throne as a child because his father was murdered. And so he was the stump, so to speak. <laughs> it took him a while to sprout. Uh, and it's not out of the question to my mind that it could have been written after the invasion of Sennacherib, when all that was left of Judah was the... Uh, it was Jerusalem, basically, that the rest of the country had been burnt down. This is described, actually, in Isaiah chapter 1. But in any case, it's a, a recipe, you know, or a prescription or prediction for what will happen when the kingdom of Judah is really brought to its knees. And then he says, a shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse. 
and the spirit of wisdom and counsel will rest on him. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. Now, we'll talk more about the royal ideology when we get to the Psalms, but he, and it's attested better for Jerusalem than it is for Samaria. But <laughs> certainly, righteousness was supposed to be the pillar of the king's throne. But then, every king in the ancient Near East claimed to uphold righteousness and to defend the weak against the rich. You get it already in the laws of Hammurabi, 500 years before Moses. But you get it here too, and the dream that you have in chapter 11 is the dream of the ideal king. And what it's saying is, if you have a really good king who is everything he is supposed to be, then the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Then nature itself will be transformed. And of course, this is hyperbolic language, but it's conjuring up a vision of lasting peace. So this, I think, is very much in line with the preaching of Isaiah, with what Isaiah's message. I think he was claiming the promise to David and the promise to Zion are good things. You know, just believe in them. But to believe in them means that if you see an army surrounding your walls, you stay calm. <laughs> you don't send to Assyria for help, as, which is what Ahaz eventually did. So, and you'd be prepared to live on milk and honey for a couple of years. So, you know, it's not all that easy a prospect, but at the same time, I think the message of Isaiah is that life will go on. There is indeed hope for the future. Comments, reactions, thoughts? Probably start, yes, Gabe. Yeah. Now, no, I mean, what you get then is, is, is what I would call typology. In other words, you use the past as the model for, the, for explaining the present or the future. You have this done with the Exodus. Already in Hosea, he talks about a new Exodus. Now, this doesn't mean that the story you read after the book of Genesis is really talking about the return from Babylon, but it means that you see an analogy. And here, I think, you know, the, the messianic hope is the hope for a righteous ruler for universal peace. And this, I think, is what Christians then hope, yeah, still hope for that. So, you know, I, I don't see any problem at all with typological exegesis, so long as you realize this wasn't the original intention of it. And uh, there's lots of that. I mean, when we get to Second Isaiah, it's the suffering servant. And again, you know, the, the uh, analogy is powerful. Okay. Next day, we will go on to the cheerful prophecies of Jeremiah <laughs> <laughs> and maybe say a little bit more about um, the invasion of Sennacherib at the start.